Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the newest edition of What You've Been Missing. Straight out of Washington, D.C., it's your man Odyssey, and I'm tuned in to Jigga Juice. Peace. Odyssey, so good to see you again. Likewise, man. Good to see you too. So uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, last time we met, you were uh, touring, at, uh, doing the uh, People Hear What They See tour. You were touring Europe. And uh, what has happened since? Oh, so much has happened since. I've released several records since then. I've toured the world a few more times. Uh, I've gotten married. What else has happened? So many things. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, yeah, I, I actually got lost with the releases because uh, you had the people what, hear what they see. That was a debut album. And then you had a few EPs. You had Tangible Dream. Uh, and The Good Fight is officially your second LP, right? Um, when it comes to instrumental records, I normally release one vocal record and afterwards I release an instrumental record. So after Tangible Dream, after um, people hear what they see, I released Tangible Dream and The Beauty and All. The Beauty and All was an instrumental album. Tangible Dream was a mixtape. And then the next follow-up album after that, yes, was uh, The Good Fight. And The Good Fight, it's a, it's a concept record. Can you tell us, uh, can you tell me and the listeners what the concept, the concept behind it is? Most of my records tend to follow some sort of a theme. With The Good Fight, the theme, the theme is one of almost realizing that there wasn't a theme. Coming to the realization that I was making a type of music that wasn't necessarily the most popular, but was necessary to make. And realizing that I wanted to make something that was seemed to be more difficult as far as a career made me realize that I was fighting for something that I had no understanding that I was fighting for. It felt so good to make this type of music. I had no idea that people were considering me their champion or their preserver of this type of hip hop. And that's when the title came together of The Good Fight. When something is good, you don't even realize you're fighting for it because it's worth it. And uh, what was the creation process of the album? Creation process was very similar to the rest of my records where it starts off with sample-based material and loose structures and then I bring in my band to play things over. My keyboard player Ralph Real, we work hand in hand. Um, my drummer John Lane, bass player Dennis uh, Guitar plays um, tracks from Oliver St. Louis is on the album as well as Gary Clark. I brought in a few collaborations as far as um, singing vocals from Mamuna Youssef, Nick Hakim, but all in all with all of those things combined the record was started on November 27th of 2014 and it was turned in on January 13th of 2015. It was very quick. And uh, I did my research and I saw that uh, for this album, the writing process, uh, you sat in one room and pretty much just wrote it in one closed and dark room, right? Definitely. With people here, what they see, I kind of developed a crutch, a dependency to be able to be stimulated, I had to write outside. I had to step away from my studio. My home became a distraction to lyrics. I had the internet and video games and friends and people and music and beats and melodies and all types of things that were starting to become a distraction. So I was starting to depend on being outside to write rhymes. Well, as I said, I started this record in November and turned it into January. I wasn't touring, it was freezing in New York. And I had no choice but to sit in the house and write this record. So I took it as a challenge to myself to say, okay, I've been able to produce music anywhere in any circumstance, but I haven't been able to write anywhere. And that place that I really need to be able to write is in my own home. So I sat down in four walls and I wrote the whole record. Yeah, that was actually the purpose of the question, to, uh, to compare, the, to, to address the, the contradiction between the creation process of the two albums. And uh, do you think, think that also the material itself sort of uh, required a different process? So just uh, the circumstance, circumstances that you mentioned? Absolutely. I think they required a different process. You know, it's, all, it's interesting how the titles, I didn't even directly do it. But people hear what they see was a very um, outwardly record where I, I depended on social observation from the outside world to create subject matter. As with The Good Fight, you can notice in the lyrics that they're a lot more personal and internal. And maybe that had something to do with being in seclusion and within a room and writing a record and just being alone with my own thoughts that I became a bit more introspective. 
for the next one. It's kind of long, so I'll, uh, I have to tell you, uh, you know, last time we did the interview, I told you something personal about uh, the You Know Who You Are song and also on that record about the song, uh, Mend It When I Said It. Uh, and it, this one hit me really hard and I wanted to share the story with you because it's a really rare opportunity. Because sure. um, you had the verse about uh, the hobby turning into an obsession, into a career and how it was a jobless profession and... For me, it's basically I'm going through the same process with uh, doing hip-hop radio because uh, in Israel, it's pretty much a jobless profession. I do three different shows. I do write reviews, get paid for very little of it. For so I, uh, and I started the master's degree this year and I started to drop out. I decided to drop out and really focus and pursue a hip-hop radio career. And that's why from here, that's why, first of all, even when I'm here in Amsterdam, I'm doing radio work, and from here I'm going to New York to try and uh, also, uh, you know, see if I could get into it. Right. So you, when I heard your verse speaking about it, those, uh, those issues, you know, turning, trying to make your obsession, in your case, actually doing it, in, uh, you know, doing the actual rap, and for me, just to do the hip-hop radio and spread it, so it hit me really hard. Oh, I'm honored. I appreciate the fact that the music resonates with you and with anyone else that, you know, that's what the music is for. It's for that purpose of letting people know that their fights and their struggles, they're not alone in and that they're worth it. And uh, that verse, uh, I mean, you explained it in the song, I guess, but still, could you, could you maybe expand about it? Uh, sure. A lot of the subject matter of the good fight battles contradictions and hypocrisies and double standards and in general the duality of humanity in that exact same song I'm being very honest about saying yes to people that I can't actually commit to making empty promises and more importantly making promises to myself that I didn't necessarily know I could back up and keep even to myself so there's promises to other people, there's promises to myself. Some of them I broke, some of them I kept, some I kept to myself, some I broke to others. And that's just the human existence. I also wanted to ask you about another song, not from the album, but a song that uh, was on a uh, tangible dream. Jesus was a mortal man. What led you to write this one? Um, you know, it's an interesting question. I get asked about that song a lot, and I always start off by saying that it wasn't a diss record at all. It was something that was just stating the obvious. You know, uh, Kanye, uh, maybe for shock value, started to call himself a god in several songs and um, in a couple of appearances, he had like on like Pharaoh ensemble and costumes. And he had this status of saying he was a god. And I, I found that very, very interesting to believe one's hype that much to think that they could say something like that, especially from someone who makes a song called Jesus Walks and then says, I'm a God. What I found interesting was wanting people to understand that they're humans, we're all humans, not necessarily to hold anyone on a pedestal, which is something that is very difficult for a lot of people to accept. I don't really hold myself on a pedestal. Anyone who knows me will tell you I do not like to be celebrated. I don't like family coming to shows just to support me if they don't listen to the music by themselves. I don't celebrate my birthday. I don't like to listen to my own music. I'm not really a person who likes to be celebrated. So a lot of that song came out of me finding it humorous how much he was celebrating himself. And I was in Paris and Kanye had done a show in Kazakhstan after he had came out with a song called I Am A God off of the last record off of Yeezus. He said, so the song calls himself a God and a lot of his uh, subject matter on the last record was anti-establishment about, you know, going against the corporate world and doing things by himself and, you know, not being a, a pawn in that game. And I commend him on that. Then he goes to do a show in Kazakhstan and they paid him like $3 million and the prince in Kazakhstan, in order to do the show, had two stipulations. He couldn't travel with a massive entourage, and he, was, he had to take pictures with anyone that wanted to take pictures with him. So a video popped up on the internet of Kanye, at basically like an open mic club where people were taking selfies with him while he was on stage. 
And I said, this guy who said he was a god for three million dollars just basically did a birthday party at an open mic. And I saw the footage. What really made it hit home was I was in Paris at a store called Colette. And I was waiting outside the store because my friend uh, works at the store. He runs the store and I was waiting for him to get off. And there was this matte black four door Porsche parked right in front of the store that me and my wife were standing in front of. And the store closes and we're waiting for Fabian to come outside. And who comes out of the Porsche? It's Kanye West. And I was like, oh, wow, he was sitting there the entire time right in front of me. I was standing in front of his car. He was in there. And he jumps out. My wife says, Kanye West, can I take a picture? He says, yeah, sure, no problem. And um, my, my wife actually got paralyzed. She couldn't believe that he said yes. So she took too long. And he says, I guess you didn't want the picture. And he jumped inside the window, the, the, the automatic doors, and then they closed. And then that was the end of that story. What I found interesting was when I realized what he was wearing when he jumped out, and then I saw the video the day before, he must have just flown from Kazakhstan to Paris. And it really hit me. I was like, oh, wow, he's wearing the exact same thing. He must have just did, made $3 million jumped on a private jet, and now he's in Paris to go shopping. I was like, this guy is very normal. He's a very normal guy, and he's very nice, too. And I was like, what is this, you know, I'm a god behavior? And then he just made me write the song. He's coming to Israel, actually, this month. But uh, he was there in, in a private visit with uh, King Kardashian in Israel a few months ago, and he decided he wanted to play a free show. And they were already trying to make the arrangements, but because of security issues, it couldn't, uh, they couldn't do it. But I guess it also, also shows you the type of guy that he is. Yeah. But uh, regarding that, that song, I think that uh, it reflected a lot of the state of mind that's also present, that, uh, that's also present in the, the Good Fight album. Definitely, it was somewhat of a predecessor of just saying, we're all human beings, we all bleed, we all have dreams, aspirations, nightmares, and none of us are any different. and stop allowing the media to make these people bigger than they are. So uh, what's next for you? Any, uh, any plans for another album, another instrumental album now? Uh, the instrumental album is called The Odd Tape. It should come out sometime early next year. I turned it in, I think it was February I turned the record in. It's been done for a while. Uh, I'm going to work on a solo album very, very soon. I've started drafting ideas in my head and laying down melodies in my phone. I'm really excited to start working on that. I thought I would have started working on it by now on the road, but I haven't really been inspired to sit down and work on it yet. I don't want to force it. Do you still do production work for other MCs? Do you have the time for that? Uh, yeah, I was doing some work with a UK artist named Plan B. We had a couple oh. sessions with him. Um, there's a couple artists who have reached out to me for production. I don't want to say any names until it's confirmed, but yeah, it's on the table. I like the track you did for Pro Era a few weeks ago. So oh, 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 for Joy Badass. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and actually, we're gonna, me, and, me and him are going to do some work, too. We ran into each other backstage at a festival in Brussels and exchanged information. I'm definitely going to send him some tracks. So. And, and I know uh, the place I come from, and, you know, it has its fair share of travel, but uh, would you come perform in Israel? If not now, then in better times? In better times, I might come to perform in Israel, but... I have to be 100 percent. If I came there, I would perform in Palestine before I get performed in Israel for several reasons. As a dual citizen of both Sudan and the United States, if I come to Israel, I wouldn't be allowed back in Sudan. I, I wish that our brothers and sisters in Philistine and Israel could look at us now as a Muslim, and I'm, a, I'm assuming you're Jewish. I know yeah. you're Israeli, but yeah, yeah. Um, we're just doing an interview, and we're talking about hip-hop, and we get along. Do you want to kill me right now? Yeah. I don't want to kill you. I, <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, you know I, I have so many friends back home where I'm from where one of the things that we relate to is that our families at one point in time came to America for a better opportunity, whether that be my Jewish friends who are descendants of Polish or Russian Jews who are predominantly where I'm from. That's what they are. You know, my good friend Peter Rosenberg, the... Uh, Uh, my good friend Zach, who started Half Tooth Records, the first record label to give me a deal. We've all coexisted and we've all been friends for years. And I hope that one, one day we could get there. With even in my own home country of Sudan, there was a conflict between Muslims and Christians, which was covered by religion, but it was really more so about politics and oil. And as with many things, it's always a deeper reason why there's a problem. And... 
unfortunately, we're all cro- we're all caught in the middle of the crossfire. So even though I have nothing against Jewish people or the existence of Israel, what's going on in Palestine is not okay. And as an example, how would it feel if I did a show in Tel Aviv and didn't do something in Palestine, knowing that human beings right across the other side of a wall are in jeopardy? As an African-American who is the descendant of slavery, how could I be okay with apartheid? I couldn't. So when things get better, yes. Even in my own place of Sudan, I've never done a show in Sudan. And I won't until things get better. So it has nothing to do with Jews and Muslims. It has something to do with humanity. I haven't done a show in Sudan yet. So uh, I guess we can just hope for some better times. And uh, end on a positive note and, you know, just really see how hip-hop brings people together. That's, I think that's a very positive thing that hip-hop does. Absolutely. I agree. Okay, Odyssey, thanks a lot. Hope we do it again sometime. Thank you. I appreciate it.